Hello, everyone joining us here in Boston and on Zoom. I'm Robin Golden, a member of the advisory board for the Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health, also known as CISWA. I am also Associate Vice President at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago and direct our Center for Excellence in Aging and our Center for Health and Social Care Integration. I'm so honored to speak today to set the stage for a discussion on shaping the future of social work in public health. What a time in our world. And during these turbulent times, it is even more critical to take advantage of opportunities we have to make a difference in people's lives, wherever they may be. Jane Adams grounded her pioneering social work in identifying communities that had the greatest need and then addressed those needs systemically. Public health, right? This school and the center's leaders, Dean Jones and Director Govaye, I knew I was gonna do that, huh? are continuing that legacy. Thank you for that. Even though there are a half million social workers practicing in the United States, social work remains one of the most misunderstood and misrepresented professions. We need to preserve our traditional roles, but also create new ones. Our vision of social work should be one in which practitioners, administrators, researchers, academics, and policymakers work together to identify and evaluate cutting edge theory, techniques, and strategies that ultimately lead to programs and policies which, which result in more responsive institutions and services and ultimately healthier individuals and communities. The social work culture needs to be re remain one of moral commitments and ethical practice cultivating and nurturing professional connections and partnerships. Even in these times when we are challenged to pay attention to the bottom line and one that never loses sight of the people we serve, I believe that through this process, we can change perceptions, demonstrate value and build a stronger future for the profession. With the burgeoning, burgeoning and perhaps belated acknowledgement of social determinants of health, it is critical we work with other professionals, including community health workers who are working at the community and system levels. As in all of our work, it will be critical that we carefully articulate our contributions to these interprofessional teams, as well as evaluate the overall impact of social work's contribution. A paradigm shift encompassing a broader workforce for health that is well-trained in prevention, health promotion, care coordination, therapeutic interventions and advocacy is so needed in this whole SDOH, if you were, would, world and improving population health outcomes. Given our professional mission, training and expertise, as well as scope of practice, we as social workers are uniquely positioned to lead this effort. In the face of so much change and opportunity, we invite you with the center to watch our efforts with our Coalition for Social Work and Health, this work is based on the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, NASM Report of 2019. And please look to support our campaign, highlighting social workers often overlook contributions to improving the nation's health. This NASM study has been used widely by health and social work organizations to advocate and promote the role of social workers in preventing and addressing health-related social needs as well as increasing healthcare quality while reducing healthcare costs. The integration of social care into physical health and mental health care will be critical drivers in addressing SDOH or social determinants or social needs and achieving health equity. Because the impact social workers have is felt everywhere, in hospitals and clinics, schools and universities, places of employment, faith institution, halls of government and in the community, it is impossible to imagine the shift to more comprehensive social and physical care with happening without us. We are grateful for the phenomenal ways that the BU School of Social Work and the center are leading in this effort, in this campaign. We could not do anything without your collaborative leadership and prestige, commitment and talent in developing research tools, practices and policies that help individuals and families here and thrive. Let us all go forth as social work leaders. May we know our impact, continue our good work, and carry forward the legacy of this remarkable profession. I thank the center as the champion of all of this and all of you 
and hope we will always know our ability to make a difference. To get today's program started, I'd like to introduce Prof Professor Linda Sprague Martinez, BU School of Social Work Associate Professor. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martinez. Thank you so much, Robin, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Linda Sprague Martinez, no surprise. I don't look like my picture because I have my COVID hair, um, but I, I'm gonna start us out with a, an acknowledgement um, that the land which BU occupies was once ho the home of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts people who stewarded the land and prospered from her gifts. These people were forcibly removed and enslaved through colonial acts of terror perpetrated by white settlers from nations seeking to extract and exploit the gifts of Mother Earth and the labor of her stewards. The deleterious effects of these acts have impacted generations of people and the land itself, as well as the relationship between people and the land. Patterns of violent oppression fueled by racial capitalism will persist until we address the root causes. Neither the planet nor her people will find peace. As social workers, we have a moral obligation to name injustices, resist oppressive structures, and to build relationships that catalyze collective action for change. So I wanna start this evening by thanking, or this afternoon by thanking the Center for Social Work Innovation and Health for organizing today's session. Um, and it's really exciting to be here as, as a center affiliate after since 2014, when I first came to BU, when the center was just launching to see all of the amazing accomplishments of the center to date. Um, so very exciting to see where we go over the next decade. Hard to believe a decade has passed. Mm -hmm. um, so with this evening's conversation, I, just a few logistical items. I'm going to lead Dean Jones and Dr. Gavea in a roundtable discussion for about 20 to 30 minutes. We're then going to open it up to the audience for all of you to chime in with questions, um, and we're gonna have questions from our in-person audience as well as from our virtual audience. Um, for those of you on Zoom, I'm gonna ask that you please type your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll share those questions um, with the virtual audience um, and our speakers. If you are a social worker and you're needing continuing education credits for this event, you are going to receive a link um, in your email after the event um, to a quiz. Um, that you must complete to receive continuing education credits. Um, this event is also being recorded and will be available on our website after at the www.siswa.org. So with that said, I am very excited to ask um, both Dr. Gavea and um, Dean Jones to join me here on stage for a conversation. Remember to take my mic, so. So, okay. So I'm thinking that maybe we can get started. You guys are all close and comfy there. Um, maybe we can get started by just talking um, a little bit to the audience about yourselves, your work, um, and a little bit about what drew you um, into the area of social work and health, just so we get a sense of who you are um, before we jump forward. So, so I'll like jump with jump in with Barbara first. All right. Well, Is that right if I call you Barbara? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, it's great to be here and be with all of you. What a wonderful afternoon we've already had. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, it's a real honor to be here as the dean. I'm about two and a half months old. So far, so good. Um, but I I was drawn to BU School of Social Work in large part because of the center and because of the potential of this center and because of my deep and passionate commitment to social work and health. And so this feels like a wonderful way to begin some of my time with all of you. I'll tell you that what drew me, I love that, I didn't, you know, we said, you could say anything, we don't know where you go. So one of the things that actually drew me to, um, I think to this work is that I was raised by a single mom who had uh, some health concerns. And so there's all the ways that we're formed and many of the ways we're formed are by the people that we care about and love the most. And I hadn't really thought about it until you asked that question when I thought, why, why have I always been so drawn to health? And I think as a young child, you know, worrying about my mom, frankly, um, and then wanting to help her and help others. In my career, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of things, but I will tell you, I started out probably my first job in health, as it were, were was as a Ryan White HIV coordinator. Um, and so more of a macro approach, shall we say, to social work. And it was right around the time that the protease inhibitors had just come on. So we were very involved in activism, frankly, and 
Uh, and then I moved from that to working with children who were facing grief and loss and who were facing cancer and facing palliative care. And so um, I practice as a clinical social work. I've been at the bedside. Uh, pr for me, the, what drew me to thinking about social work and education and health is that I remember being at the bedside with kids and families and thinking, I learned the most. Why didn't I learn this in school? And I learned the most when I know to be quiet and to listen to the children and families. I still think that's a really great way to learn is when we're quiet and we listen to people. And I thought surely we could do better. And that sort of motivated my desire to do research and education in health specifically. And so um, A uh, somewhat similar origin story uh, goes back to my childhood as well, uh, why I decided to go into social work. I grew up in the city of Lowell, and for those of you who don't know, Lowell is uh, one of the most diverse communities we have in the state. And I grew up in the most diverse neighborhood, uh, economically, ethnically, racially, which runs the gamut. I also went to Catholic school. And so in my early upbringing in Catholic school, I learned a lot about putting other people's needs, paying attention to other people's needs, and making sure that people are at the center of how we're making decisions. But unfortunately, also while growing up in the city of Lowell, even though I was experiencing, my mic sounds like it's going in and out. Is that just me? I want to make sure that you all can actually hear me. OK. Um, so I was experiencing this Catholic school education and at the same time seeing in my community that so much human suffering was happening. Um, a lot of poverty with the, um, you know, the, the mills going to Southern states and then eventually overseas. Um, so real economic distress that families were experiencing. I also saw racism and xenophobia, even though it wasn't my own experience, seeing it close up. Um, because I was coming of age when Lowell became a resettlement location for families fleeing the Khmer Rouge. So I witnessed this trauma, witnessed the grief and the loss and the challenges that come with trying to um, create a sense of belonging, quite honestly, and saw just repeatedly how so many people uh, were not experiencing the conditions and the situations of belonging. So I decided at a young age that I wanted to run for office. And, um, but everybody around me uh, was politically connected, came from politically connected families or families with money, and they were older white men. So I thought, well, I'm not gonna be able to run for office. That, clearly that's not gonna be my path. So let me see what else I can do. And that's how I settled on BU School of Social Work uh, because it had a very strong macro program, uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know, who are newer to uh, social work in the audience, uh, is really focused on systems change, policy change, leadership management. And then eventually I did run for office. I served in the Massachusetts legislature for four years in the middle of COVID while I finished my doctorate in public health, focused on non-arrest policies for opioid use and addiction. And I was also serving and finishing my doctorate while I was uh, 14 years in as a single parent to my two children. And so I carry with me a lot of these experiences and my academic background when I decided to run for lieutenant governor for the state of Massachusetts. And, you know, again, talking about health and well being and putting people's dignity at the center when we're making decisions. And so that is what has compelled me uh, to enter into public health and social work, what it has meant to me in my career. We can talk about some of the other things that I've done along the way, but those are the sort of touchstones uh, throughout my journey. And just so incredibly proud to be back here now as the new director for the center. Uh, started July 1, hit the ground running, um, and just look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, thank you both so much. And it's interesting to hear the different ways in which your stories intertwine, mm -hmm. right? And and also the spectrum of health that you've touched on as you're throughout your careers. I'm hearing, and of course, I heard that early macro ring for both of you, um, which I was drawn to, but that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think it's interesting that 
you've touched on health care, health policy, um, public health. And, and I wonder if you can talk for a little bit for us about what is it about social work leadership and health and, and particularly social work innovation? Because we talk a lot about innovation. We don't always talk a lot about social work and innovation together, although a lot of what we do is very innovative, especially in the context of health. And so I'm wondering if you can, as I'll get back to my question, if you can talk for us a little bit about what does social work bring to health um, in the context of innovation? And, and so think a little bit about social work innovation and then what does that bring to health and, and why why is that different? Well, given the number of health professionals, um, what does social work bring and how does social work operate in those contexts? It's a big question. I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so one, you know, you've put a lot of things in that question, which is a great question. I love it. And we could just riff on that. But I will say that for what it's worth, I actually think that social work claiming our leadership in health is in and of itself innovative. I wish that was not true. Mm -hmm. But we need to claim our own leadership and our own skill set and our own knowledge and our ability to lead into professional teams. We, we had a lovely conversation as we were getting ready. I do focus more on the health side and Tammy focuses more on the public health. So you'll you'll hear those themes. So thinking from the spaces that I practice, not only participating as a member of interprofessional teams, leading interprofessional teams, leading care conferences, leading how we think about system change in a hospital, how we think about it in a community, how we think about it in our entire society. And I think that what social work brings that, that again, shouldn't be innovative, but is, is we bring an equity lens. We bring an understanding of people in their environment. Again, to us who are social workers, as many of us are, we say, well, yes, you just stated the obvious. You just said, so what? That's people and environment. But to others, that is a radical idea. And I'll tell you, I had an opportunity when I was at a former institution that shall not be named. Um, I was at a former institution. I had an opportunity to teach a class, um, and lead a class that was co-sponsored by our med school and our business school, and it was about value-based healthcare. And uh, so, it was talking about the class was something about you know sort of understanding the value of people in their understanding the value for people. It was social work 101, really. And it was healthcare leaders, business leaders from around the country and actually from around the world. And so in this class, I would teach them about this concept of people in the environment. These are CEOs. These are, And they would all take their pen and they would write it down. You would think I hung the moon that I would consider that we would talk about people in their environment. And so that which we take for granted in our knowledge base is radical, is innovative and is uh, influential in how we lead healthcare. And so I feel very strongly that leading into our own skill base and our own knowledge base, and then sharing that with great humility as we walk in this world that has a lot of disparity, a lot of inequity. Uh, how do we then move in spaces where we bring that? We are the one that raises that question about, I wonder if the reason, you know, and again, from my practice working with children and families, I wonder if, the reason that mom's not at the bedside is actually because she's raising three other children on her own. I wonder if we could not blame and shame her. That's a social work question, um, and it shouldn't be innovative, but it is what, part of what we bring. So I could riff more on that. But I think in and of itself, our leadership skills, our knowledge of people in their environment, and hopefully our fight for justice and equity, things that we bring to all healthcare environments. I really appreciate I really appreciate that response and it just um an interesting uh, anecdote with it not an anecdote but um we were teaching the interdisciplinary social work medical education here um the last a couple of, we've been teaching it for a couple of years and one of the the big things from the medical students that came out was that wow social workers really ask these different questions and one of them was in the questioning was a parent and the social work student said well how old is your child and the medical student was like like, wow, I wouldn't have thought to ask that question yeah. to engage the parents. So I think that really important things, the way we question as social workers. Yeah. So, great. I'm and so Tim you shared that story because the thing I was thinking about that we bring to our work, whether it's in our own families, our own communities, or out there in the world, uh, at the national stage, the global stage, is our curiosity, is our desire to understand, get to know people as people what motivates them, what pains them, keeps them up at night? What are the ideas that they have to solve their own problems if they just had a little bit of a reach out from 
government, from funders, right? So I think a lot about the curiosity that we bring and so much of innovation comes out of necessity. It comes out of not having enough and figuring out how to piece it all together. Social workers every single day for ourselves, for our organizations that we're leading, in halls of government and in at the bedside or in uh, public health departments, we are constantly looking for how can I hobble all of this together to make this work, to improve this program, to reach this population more effectively, to really help people in the way that they need to be helped, the way that they have identified for themselves in that co-creating. I think there's a lot of innovation that's coming from our field about how to understand those felt problems and identify and co-create the solutions together and co-create help together. It's not just um, you know, the paradigm of the consumer and the producer, but we are all have the opportunity to create the conditions for everybody to thrive and to co-create that together. So that's how I think about innovation. And there's an opportunity for us to do more with technology in that co-creation, with different payment models, with different policies. And it all just comes from having the vulnerability to try something new and make a mistake or not have it go according to plan, but failing forward and learning from that because eventually we'll get to the point where we're able to ad address a problem that we don't, we can't even conceive of right now because we just haven't even taken those steps. So I think social work is so uniquely positioned to lead in those ways. Mm -hmm. can I yes, go ahead. Yeah, you can see I it. can see it. I was like, oh, keep You're going. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would also say one of the other qualities that you are talking about, uh, Tammy, in in how you're speaking about this is tenacity. Mm -hmm. And so I really believe that that is part of what we are training social workers and part of what we need to train social workers, that, that desire, that determination, that tenacity, whether it's in health or public health, that we will not rest, that we have to stay with it until we help this child and family, in my case, we help this community. We're, we don't just say, well, well, that didn't work out. I mean, you all know as social workers, right? We are the ones who uh, you just, you know, sort of like, okay, I'm going to stay on this, whatever this is, until I solve this unsolvable problem, you know, uh, just just give me the lane and I'm going to keep going. And I think that tenacity is important too. Great. I wonder if you could now think about, um, you know, given when we, we think about health inequities and injustices, um, that we're facing, how can social work leverage these innovations to actually advance um, health justice and, and, and equity? Again, I think that uh, it has to do with how we keep this at the forefront of everything we're thinking about. And so if I am, and I keep going back to this idea of sort of being a, a health social worker in this very traditional way, but if I meet a family I'm not meeting, you know, I'm meeting them in the context of their community, the resources they have or have not had, the discrimination they have or had not felt. Um, all of those things come to that moment. It's not just them in front of me, isolated from their history and probably their people's history, right? We all carry generations of history and inequity with us. And so I hope that every time as a clinical social worker, I sort of sometimes miss being a clinical social worker. You can probably tell. Um, I hope that when I've been a clinical social worker and as I've had the opportunity to train clinical social workers, that I have kept that frame always that I need to be thinking about what is inequitable here, what is what is the context of this person's life, um, what are the ways that I need to sort of um, bring resources to help them, and then what are the ways that I need to go to the macro? I, I think it's a false divide, this micro-macro. Sorry, I really do. I don't know how to tend to people who are in front of me without thinking about the social conditions and the material conditions that led to this moment, and I don't know how to do that without listening to people in front of me, and so I think we always have to be walking that line between clinical practice and policy and community organizing and system change, and it all comes together. It should not be so. We should hold all of it at the same time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so suddenly, there's a, suddenly yeah. we have the faculty are like, what do you mean there's a, we have a macro? Yeah. No. I'm like, no, we need to keep our school. I'm just saying, yeah. we need to always think about micro and macro. Yeah. Right. And Tammy, do you want to talk Yeah, I think from what you were just talking about, I think of um, interconnectedness is the, is the term that comes to mind, right? We are so interconnected with each other here in our country, 
across the world, there's interconnections. And I think leaning into those interconnections and again, having the vulnerability to listen and to learn in whatever context we're in is, is part of that story. But I also think about what is the role, little p policy and big p policy, right? Mm -hmm. Policy happens in every, and politics, sorry folks, politics happens <laughs> in everyday life, whether we want to call it that or not. But when we're interacting in any sort of human relations, there are politics involved because power dynamics are involved. And so I think calling out those power dynamics, addressing them head on, just like you, know, you talked about in the land acknowledgement, addressing those inequities that are systemic and structural and intergenerational that go back centuries and calling out what those power dynamics are is the only way we'll be able to start to identify and address them. And those are what drive inequities. And you know, I think about what we can do in our own organizations is advocate for changes in the ways that our pension system is working in our own organization, right? Like making sure that the investments that we have, that they're going into places that are advancing equity. Or if you're in a position of um, elected office as I was, standing up for the things that will really be high leverage in achieving health equity, like voting access or access to housing, access to jobs that not only are uh, providing a, a somewhat of a decent wage, but that are really a livable wage. Like those are the things that I think social workers are trying to be. And when I first, it's kind of funny, when I first ran for office, I thought, oh, people are gonna be like, oh, there's a social worker who's running. And I thought people would say, nah, we want a business person, we want an attorney. And person after person, when I was door knocking said, oh my God, you understand people. You understand what people are struggling with. Yes, I wanna support you. And when I told one of the leaders of our unions here in this state that I was running for uh, state representative, he's like, great, we need more social workers up there. They're the ones that change the world. So I think leaning into that um, to achieve that, that the issues around um, health equity are just part of the work. It's And again, it's about that co-creating and not assuming that we know all the answers in the social work profession. Families know what their, what their needs are as well. Mm -hmm. We probably can't rest on our laurels either. You know, I mean, I think sometimes as social workers, uh, it's really comfortable to be in the social justice lane, right? Like we're for justice, yay, and we are. And we need to challenge our own um, our own systems, our own learning. We need to challenge our own history and wonder together and change together. Um, what isn't equitable about the systems that we contribute to and how can we work on that? And we, you know, there's different ways to do that. Some are big changes, some are small changes, but we don't have the, we should not rest. We should not say, well, it's okay. I'm a social worker, so I'm for social justice. I don't have to sort of trouble my own profession. And it's like, no, actually we have to do that too. And we can hold the both end of that. I believe we can, we can hold both. We can be proud of who we are and we can challenge the ways that, you know, perhaps our profession has needed to grow in terms of making things more equitable. I think we can do both at the same I think we have to do both at the same time. Yeah. And you bring me right into my next question. <laughs> it's just great. Um, per particularly given this piece that you're saying that we as a profession need to grow. Um, and I can think of um, a lot of work around just the, the whitewashing of social work and how um, communities of color voices have not been built into curriculums have not, and then also harms that social work can cause in communities. Yeah. And so as you're thinking about um, really looking inside um, at at social work as a profession. Where do you see we have to go as a curriculum? I'm ask Barbara to start with this curriculum, and I have another question just for you, Tammy. Yeah. Um, but just really, where do we need to go in terms of training social workers, the next generation, the future, if we're going to get to this innovation where, where we're leverage, where we're able to leverage social work innovation to advance health equity? Um, what does that mean for how we train social workers? That's a great question. It's one that I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time thinking about well, with friends and colleagues uh, for some time to come. But the first first part for me really comes to, again, this idea that we can't just rest and say like, well, this is what we've always taught. And so therefore we will always teach this. The world is not the same, or maybe our awareness of that. Maybe the world is the same. And in fact, we are now <laughs> questioning things more deeply. But in either case, we can't just rest on historical approaches to social work. I think we really need to keep saying this, but we really need to trouble those. And we need to open it up, look at it, wonder if that is actually relevant, wonder what communities and for whom it is relevant. And if it is not relevant, then we need to expand it. I think another way that we need to expand is to listen to communities 
listen to what they're telling us about what our education is or is not doing in terms of meeting their needs. Listen to our students who have a lot to offer us. There's reasons they've come to social work and they bring all of their historical perspectives as well. We need to listen to them and we need to learn together about how do we improve our own curriculum so that we are meeting the needs of all the people that we are charged to serve. And that really is it, it is a service. Uh, it is still an honor to me to be a social worker. I just never, even with the things that I know we have to improve on, I sort of never lost the the fire of how important it is to have social work in our world. But I want us to also evolve and I want us to grow and I want us to teach each other ways to really move in community that are have more honor, more respect um, and, and more humility, frankly. Uh, so we have to learn from the communities that we serve and we have to evolve our curriculum. And I think... Honestly, I'm biased, but hey, I've got the mic. Uh, I think BU School of Social Work is ahead of the game on this. I think we lead and I'm really proud. And it's, again, one of the reasons I was drawn here is that I knew that this was a school that wanted to do this together. There are other great schools. I've been at some, so have you, but BUSSW is really leading in this space and 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 not resting either, not just saying, therefore, we don't have to think about it. I think we think together, we, we worry together, we plan together, we recreate curriculum together and we have to. It is the charge of our EPAS to have anti-racist curriculum. Um, that should not be something that re requires a revision and yet social work across the country is in fact doing some revisions, aren't we? So that means we've got work to do. I'll stop ripping now. Yeah, no, and I just wanna pick up on this point where you say BU is in the lead. And I think one of the ways that we're leading is even having the Center for Social Work Innovation and Health. And it's such an important platform to be able to advance social work. So Tammy, I'm just wondering if you can talk with us a little bit about opportunities you see as we move forward in the future to really leverage this resource of the center um, to, to achieve this mission of advancing innovation. Yeah, I, I want to start with first addressing yeah. issues related to equity and how we're starting to talk about um, looking in the mirror about the, how social work has played a role in upholding systems of oppression and white supremacy, particularly when you think a lot about um, child protective services, mm -hmm. but it runs the gamut. Um, and now social workers are being called to lead in and to provide services within law enforcement yeah. agencies. What are the kind of ethical yeah. questions and ethical dilemmas on one hand, that's a really good thing. It's an important thing because we have to have that big conversation about policing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the ethical dilemmas that our social workers are facing every single day when they're in a system that is even further behind than social work and health and public health are in these conversations. So they are things that we're already starting to actively talk about within the center is how do we start to have those kinds of conversations and those convenings so that we are you know, really leaning into and living our commitment to health equity and addressing uh, anti-oppressive practices. And the ways that the center will start to lead or continue to lead, I shouldn't say, but start because I just got here, my starting, but it has been ongoing, is thinking about the kind of research that we do, making sure that there's always true equity approaches within that, whether we're talking about disabilities, we're talking about LGBTQ, we're talking about communities of color or low-income folks. So really having an eye towards that in all of our research projects, but also in the kinds of convenings that we hold, that it's really spread throughout the work. You know, I've had people ask, oh, do you have a focus on equity? And I really, I, I, I um, cringe a little bit at that because I really think it's about how we live the values and we're doing a lot of that kind of work within the center. And we'll continue to you know, look for ways to partner with all of you, with our faculty, with our students, and with our folks um, who are you know, part of our global family and our advisory board as well. Great. So any additional comments, Barbara? You look like, I never know if you're going to chat. No, up. I sort of had one that went away because I was just so compelled by what Tammy was saying. So no. Keep okay. Keep thinking. Yeah. Keep thinking. But I don't want to uh, monopolize all the time. I want to be able to open it up to the audience for additional questions. I see a hand already from Dr. Ham in the back. Um, and so we'll take... Um, Couple questions in the audience. We're also going to make sure we jump to questions for those of you who are online with us. Um, but with that, I'll I'll turn it over to Hayu. Go ahead. Oh, and if we could use Let, the use the mic. Yep. Sorry. So great to have you both. Uh, my name is Hayu Chris Ham. I'm a professor at School of Social Work, and I have a question for you. Um, you know, climate crisis is really coming to us as an existential threat. And climate crisis is a financial crisis. 
a couple of days ago, there was a uh, Wall Street Journal article talking about this one couple. They got the insurance letter from the insurance. They opened up. Actually, it went up 10 times. So they're asking, they have to pay $100,000 for the insurance premium for their house. Now, they did another research, and then they found out it's another $30,000, OK? So what they decided to do is that they just go off from the insurance, and they just take a chance, all right? And you may think that, OK, it's a problem with California, because California, a lot of insurance, they said, no, we are not going to insure you guys anymore, stay farm. And Florida, OK? But then today, there was an article in the Boston Globe about Massachusetts, all right? So, you know, a lot of insurance are now increasing the premium of 60%, 70% this year. We don't know about next year, the following year. And the climate justice issue, climate crisis is a real issue. So my question for you is that, what are your, our vision as a social worker? I mean, you may have some research going on in the center, but then you may not. Maybe you can perhaps talk about this important issue of climate crisis, how as a social work um, profession can deal with this issue. Thank you so much. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. Really appreciate it. I think there are a couple things. Uh, we can learn a lot from COVID and the ways that social workers were not at the table in COVID response and recovery. And that also, um, I put in the same vein, that social workers need to be at the table around emergency preparedness. And we do have some work that has already come out of the center and helping families with medical complexity be prepared for what does it mean if you have a child that um, needs certain medication that needs to be refrigerated and we lose power for a week and you don't have refrigeration, what does that mean for the health of your child, right? So like that granular to getting social workers to be part of the conversation around preparing for the climate response and preparing for all kinds of disruptions that we're, that we're potentially facing, right? With, with conflict, with response to elections, with uh, the climate crisis. So we do have some work going on in the center on that. I do hope that we will continue to build on that and perhaps look for some funding support because the center is also globally focused, right? And we know that Places that are experiencing the climate crisis have been experiencing it for years. It's just all of a sudden we're starting to pay more attention to it because we've started to experience the extreme weather conditions that come along with uh, the climate crisis. So that's that's how I see that and elevating the role that social workers play across the board when it comes to that emergency preparedness and response. Yeah, and I think I would just reinforce that, uh, again, social workers and social work values and social work voice need to be in all these conversations, because when we look at issues of climate crisis and climate injustice, we see the same inequities and we see the same disparities that we see in every other structural condition of the world, right? It is not the same. People do not experience in climate effects the same way. There is injustice and inequities in that, which have a lot to do with where people live and the resources that they have. And you know, the resources that they have to recover. So once again, it is an issue of equity and justice, and we have to be raising that as well. It's a huge uh, question and a huge concern. It's something I know we as a school are trying to be more involved in conversations, have some new faculty with a focus, um, and then we're trying to be more involved in conversations across campus and beyond. Whenever there's, and I, I'm appreciating this, that whenever there's the discussion going on on this campus around climate justice, they do, they come to us and there are people who can respond and be there. So it's a great question and, and one we're gonna have to stay engaged with, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you so much. Is there a question online at all? There are no questions online right now, but I did want to encourage anyone that did have a question that's online, I will be able to read them out here and um, then we'll get a response for you directly. Wonderful. Great. I see a hand in the back from Ruth Paris. So the active like like back it. corner. Next, it's going to have to be on the other side of the room. Yeah, so get ready. Yeah. I'm Ruth Paris. I'm also a faculty member of the School of Social Work, and it's delightful to sort of see you, although I'm sitting back here. Next time we have to, I need a platform. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Can't really see you very well back here. Um, I, I'm my first job at a social work school was in pediatrics in a hospital. And so that's where I started my career and still feel very centered in that. So I'm going to speak a little bit more to the clinical social work end, although I think my question has sort of bigger possible answers there for both of you to take on. I really appreciate 
Barbara, your particular, you know, leadership in the health space. The health space, I was trained as a medical social worker that I was in a host institution. Oh, I remember that. Right? Remember that term? Yeah. And so it was like we were there by the good graces of those other people. I'm not going to mention who they are, but you know who they are. And that we were allowed to be doing this work uh, because they saw it, you know, maybe as part of the team and also interestingly pay structures, we, you know, that social work was like absorbed in, which meant that if the pay structures weren't so good, social workers were kind of out, right? So there's a lot of different pieces there, but I, my question really is about, you mentioned the values that are, in, you know, sort of the center of who we are. People are discovering those values. You taught the the MBAs and the CEOs about the values that we kind of know so well, and here they are sort of learning them. And then I would say um, maybe taking them on and taking credit for them a little bit, right? And then then we don't see the social workers in the leadership anymore of those things. So what are the strategies for getting us at the table consistently speaking the values that are central to social work, all the things we've been talking about today, and actually taking credit and, and getting credit, demanding credit for all of that. I mean, I think, again, our values are being now out there in the world, but I don't see as many social workers out there in those leadership positions. So that's my question. How long do we have? Um, so thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, I don't know if that's a softball or like the kind of question that I could just hang on all day. Thank you for that, Ruth. Um, I feel like that's a lot of what I have been doing. I'm looking at my friend Robin Golden over here. A lot of what I've been doing recently is sort of that um, opportunity when someone else discovers the good work of social work to gently lead them, or maybe not so gently, lead them to the realization that social work has been doing that for a hundred plus years, right? Whatever it is. And and I've had it happen a couple of times. I remember happening one time in a very large doctor e conference. Some of my best friends are doctors. They really are. And in fact, a lot, I, actually joking aside, a lot of the leadership roles that I've been able to have have honestly been because physician colleagues have practiced with social work and then they see the value of social work and they say, now I don't want to practice without social work. In fact, I want to lift up. So I want to use my power to lift up social work higher. And typically when that happens, I go, okay, because it's going to help the field, right? So I really do mean that, that our true collaborations, and it does sometimes take someone with more power in the system to recognize our value. And then what we have to do is take that challenge. It's easier to say, well, I'm too busy. I don't have time to start a department of health social work in a medical school. I really didn't have time to start it. But I had somebody saying, if we're going to be truly interprofessional, we need social work at the leadership table. Will you be there? Yes, yes, I will. You know, so it's both. It's somebody seeing the value of social work. And it wasn't about me. It was the large interprofessional education we were doing. It just happened to have social work in it. And I was leading that effort. Um, and then it's about stepping up when somebody says, will you sit on this NASM committee? Will you come and speak to this uh, esteemed body? Will you talk about the power of social work? And when the more that we can say yes, and, and the more that we can remember to say that we are social workers. Sometimes in our fields, we get higher up and we drop the social work part. And it's a personal pet peeve of mine because I really believe that we need to maintain that. So as you, you know, we have our Mary Lou Sutters here with us who never dropped social work uh, from anything that she did, was the highest ranking social worker in this office and never stopped reminding people that she was a social worker. That's social work leadership. And so I think we have to do that. Um, and then I think when we do hear someone sort of claiming something, we have to remember to them that we have those skills and we have to do it in a way they can hear. And that's the tricky walk. Because sometimes you want to say, I remember, again, being at a palliative care conference, lovely group of people, and big standing room only NIH funded study, people are just like all wrapped and a doctor is presenting and he had done this study. And at the end of it, all this money from NIH had discovered that the thing that helped patients and families was empathy. And everybody was like, oh, empathy, you know, again, <laughs> writing the thing down. And I'm in the back of the room like that, like, 
<laughs> she at the discussion period, tiny little person in the back of her mind said, you know, oh, that's so fantastic. I'm really glad that we love empathy, pro empathy. Um, and it really, and I was trying to think like, how do I say this that doesn't, you know, this is his presentation. I'm not going to go anywhere if I'm like, you forgot us. That's not going to get me anywhere. So I tried to say as gently as I could, you know, and your findings really reinforce the importance of the interprofessional team like social work and, you know, and it was a tiny little voice in a very big room. He was very not pleased that I offered this to him, I could tell. And yet there were people in the room who came up to me afterwards and said, thank mm -hmm. you for saying that. So that's, you know, this many more doctors that have heard it. That's this many more social workers that have heard it. And we just keep saying it. I don't mean it. There's also been times when I've people have said things and really I'm just like saying other things in my head and I'm not coming up with an eloquent comment. That happened to be one that went well. Other times I'm just really frustrated when they discover social determinants of health. And I just think that's quaint. You know, and I can't say that's pain because that sounds a little snarky. So I have to come up with some. So those are the days I don't say anything. I really appreciate that comment. Recently, we have um, a faculty member at the School of Social Work who's working with um, physicians who are doing great work around social determinants of health, but without an equity lens or a root cause analysis. And so mm -hmm. social determinants can become completely watered down yeah. to as opposed to understanding racialized policies that have created these conditions. So. I think that social work lends a lot there. Yeah. So we need to keep claiming that space. And but we do need to when you feel like you want to shout out, that's quaint. That's probably not the time to raise your hand, right? Because they're not going to hear you. But when you think you can bring it to them or one on one later say, I just think this is great, but I want to remind you there's a whole profession that is dedicated to this. And probably your work would go further if you were to engage us. Excellent. Great. Um, so we're gonna go online for a moment, then we're gonna come back over to Jeff. We're starting to get some nice questions rolling in. The first one I had was from Melanie Morris. How does the center and BUSSW plan to support internal and community initiatives to promote the role of social work in various health settings, e.g. dental, pharmacy, et cetera? Great question. Thank Love you, it. Melanie. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is pretty special about us here at BU and, the, and both the School of Social Work and the center is that we are at a university that has a dental school, has a medical school, has Sargent College, has, you know, the business school, the law school, every part of society has some sort of academic focus here at the university. So I think there's opportunities for us within the center to start to bring people together in a multidisciplinary way. We've already started to have some of those conversations with our board, with some of our board members, with some folks who are in other parts of the campus university, uh, the, the campus community, to start to figure out how do we start to bring social workers, engineering students, art students together to really look at some of the issues that we're facing and come up with some unique and innovative approaches, innovative solutions. You know, we're, we're looking at starting a social work innovation lab where we'll really start to seed some of these interesting ideas and iterate around them and try to get some donor support just to sort of see what can we do uh, slightly differently, but also looking at that multidisciplinary and getting more into these spaces. And then I actually would like to invite you to talk a little bit about the VR project that's been going on, because I think that's an example of perhaps what Melanie is asking about. Oh, yeah, that's the, um, it's, it's um, Dr. Um, Pablo Buchon de la Vega from the um, in general internal medicine. So um, it's a course that originally started around social determinants of health screening. I see Maddie in the audience for part of that original 2016 conversation. Um, but over time, um, it was about how do you train? Um, how can we train if we're going to address social determinants? As you're pointing out that, you know, health inequities are complex. There are many layers. We can't just do it alone as health professionals. We need um, folks who are economists. We need folks who are mm -hmm. in business. We need um, folks who are across across um, disciplines. And so this was specifically to think about how could we train um social work students together with medical students that started as a pilot and PAs. And so virtual reality was the way to go. Um, Pablo received a grant from um, Digital Innovation Lab, I believe it was, and then um, he invited us to participate. And so we didn't have time, as you pointed out. I really appreciated that. No one had time for that. Um, but we made time for it because time is a social construct. Anyone knows that time is a social construct. And so we made time and we ended up um, training the social work students. And then after that, it followed up with nutrition. And it's something that the center took over last year in that partnership. Um, so that was really exciting. So my answer was going to be 
uh, build on the great work that Linda's already started. So, uh, I mean, really interprofessional collaborative research, interprofessional collaborative education. And uh, I think you've done a great job already. Yeah, no, well, I think it's the having those great partners at the Med School Pablo's group is great. And I know that um, Dr. Belkin Martinez is also working with him to introduce Liberation Health Model to all of the medical students and residents, which has been really exciting to see um, through a HRSA funded grant. So some good things happening there. Now back over to Jeff, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, the microphone. Sorry. Got to get the microphone. Thank you to each and, and all of you. This is an inspiring conversation. My question is uh, maybe especially directed to a former legislator. What would it take for the center to have impact in the legislative arena? Uh, and is that does that matter? How long would it take? I think it definitely matters, um, for sure. It definitely matters. I think um, what it would take is one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about and even starting to have conversations with some staff about is really having um, a policy focus. So we do phenomenal research that comes out of the center. We have projects and programs that are ongoing, building those into some sort of policy space, policy briefings, getting down to Congress. It's one of the things that I really want to do, although we're not really in the greatest place right now with Congress being the most functional, but there are some opportunities to really build relationships because passing policies and trying to get these ideas into the policy space and public financing or um, you know uh, healthcare financing is about building those relationships and having those conversations and saying, we're here, we're experts, we're here to answer questions you have, holding briefings, uh, both down in Congress, but also across, across the country and, and local halls of government and our state legislators. And Charles Lewis, who's here, he's on our board. He is part of the social work caucus down in Congress. We learned that there's a public health caucus and a social determinants of health caucus. These are levers that we can pull on through the center. How long will it take us to get there? Uh, it depends on what we're really talking about. Um, I think we could easily try to pass like some smaller piece of legislation in the next year or two. If you want to talk about bigger systems change and transformation, that's a bigger conversation. But I think it's one that, uh, you know, we're hoping to be able to sort of take on leaning into a lot of the really great work that's already been going on um, in the center. Yeah. Excellent. Great answer. Um, we only have a little bit of time left. I want to take one more question because you've been waiting so patiently in the back. And then what do we need to do? Because we have three questions online right now. One. I think we got to move on. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll come back. Uh, my name is Ann Kirby. I'm a student in the dual degree social work and public health. Um, and my question is about what you were talking about, Dean Jones, with um, kind of always walking the line between clinical work and policy and activism. Um, and I think that people that are in this field in the intersection of social work and health are uniquely positioned to be that interdisciplinary role of integrating macro and clinical work. And I think that's really important um, for clinical social workers to always be involved in higher level systems advocacy and also for more macro level social workers to have a sense of what's going on on the clinical level. Um, so my question, I guess, is two parts. One, how can we strategically choose as professionals um, what things we are capable of and have the capacity to actually do um, and not take on too much that it becomes unrealistic to actually get anything done. And then also how we can be advocates in these different spaces for integrating the clinical and kind of macro perspective um, for our colleagues who may be more um, zoned in on one or the other. Okay, wow, great question. How lucky are we that you're in our program? So thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I, again, I, I guess I feel like it's been a false divide in my own career and that is because, and maybe you can relate to this, 
when I really care about something, like I want to make all the change, you know, and I, I want to um, be present and make the change for the person that's in front of me who might need my support. And then I want to go and, you know, advocate, whether it's at a legislature or it's in some other way. Um, my mother used to tease me. She said, Barbara, you always live in a capital city. Um, I said, well, I have a lot to say. You know, she came in, I lived in Austin for a while, like 20 years, and she came to visit the first time. I said, okay, mom, we're just going to have to stop down at the Capitol and then we'll go out to dinner. And she was like, that's my daughter, you know, um, because I have a lot to say. So when you're passionate, so find what you're passionate about. And that will lead you, right? Because you'll want to help the individuals in front of you. And then you'll want to make the system change so that the next set of individuals doesn't suffer in this way. And 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 it's neither, it's never an either or, it's both, especially when we talk about things like, you know, racism and, you know, anti-Semitism and uh, poverty and all of the issues that we face. It's never an either or, it's all together. Uh, we need to address all together. Um, and so then I think if we're more macro focused, we can learn from our clinical colleagues and then we can say to them, that's such important work that you're doing. Did you know there is this organized group that is going to the legislature today? Um, are you registered to vote? Can we get our community involved? And often there are collective efforts. You don't have to go by yourself. You know what I mean? Like there's often some kind of collective effort that is trying to enact change. And maybe it is a policy that can really turn so we want to we want to be engaged in both the long range plans that seem impossible because we have to vision a different world. Otherwise, what are we doing in social work? Right. And then those short term things are like, maybe we can actually make this policy go through. Let's do both. So I, I'm glad you're in our program. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I do want to um, thank both Barbara and Tammy for joining us here on stage. For additional questions, if you're online, we can type in responses after. Um, but we're, we are um, going to wrap up this portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Barbara. And I would also, um, just one important key thing I heard a theme throughout this is the importance of a professional identity as a social worker yeah. and really holding on to that and, and, and also the values that come along with that and not being too shy um, to insert yourself and share those in a very nice way. I just want to mention to that end that there are some excellent thought provoking questions yeah. this, uh, that came up and, uh, and we did not get to get to them. And we just wanted to make sure everyone's aware um, that has participated, participated in submitted questions that we will make sure that we get answers to those. And um, we'll send all those out because I think they're great questions for everyone to consider. Thank awesome. you. We'll, we'll Thank collect you so those. Much. I really appreciate that. Um, well, we've so enjoyed everybody's time today and your um, just your engagement and your being a part of this community. And I learned a lot. And thank you for just being in dialogue with all of us. Um, before we break for uh, our time, I do want to take a brief moment to acknowledge our esteemed colleague, Professor Professor <laughs> Linda Sprague Martinez, who's moving on from her post at the school. Remember when I said what I, was, I was a grief expert? Now I'm not dealing with my grief very well. Um, she would not let us, she honestly would not let us throw, throw her a party because she promises and says she's going to stay engaged. So I was like, I'll take that. But I do want to say a little more about you, Linda. Don't get away. So um, she's leaving to become and talk about social work leadership and talk about leadership to become the next director of Health Disparities Institute at UConn School of Medicine and UConn Health. It's incredible news for her and for the greater work. Um, we know that UConn is very fortunate to have you and we are reluctantly reluctantly not clutching your ankles. Um, and I know a lot of people feel mixed emotions like I do at the loss for our community, but she has agreed to continue her affiliation both at the school and the center. Um, I wanna say more, she's gonna be very upset with me, but Linda has had a huge impact at the school at, at and at CISWA and throughout numerous communities. Um, in addition to her work as an associate professor and former chair of the macro department at the School of Social Work, she was a faculty affiliate with the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research and co-director of the Boston University NIH funded Clinical Translational Science Institute Community Engagement Program. 
at BUME, and she created so much positive change. On a personal note, I've had the opportunity to know Linda uh, for a number of years and got to know her more when she was on my search committee. She didn't tell me she might, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and uh, we're both first generation college students. I think we share that as well. Um, she was one of the first to welcome me to BUSSW and uh, just to sort of help me see my path in leadership here. And I'm really grateful to you for that, Linda. I'm gonna miss working with you in this current role, but I am gonna hold you to the staying connected. So we wish you so much much success and we are going to miss you in this role but um we're going to keep working together so thank you and next i'm going to have luis lopez come up So I am Luz Lopez and I'm the director of the Global Health Corps. And I am so appreciative of your time, of your leadership. And I'm so excited about what's coming. I think the center has been a, a source of change and more is coming. And I want to thank you, Dean Jones, Dr. Govea and Linda for being here. We appreciate your insights and these discussions. Thank you to everybody that uh, participated both uh, online and, and here in person. Thank you to Robin for setting the stage for us and framing the work that is ongoing and that lies ahead for social work in health. I want to thank also a mentor of mine, the Betty Roos, who was the founder of this uh, social work public health. And I know she, her presence is here. And thank you for inspiring us to continue the work of public health social work and social work in health, both here and globally. I think this is a time for social workers to make a difference globally. As you know, we are in these terrible times and I think our role is key and we can make a difference and we need psychosocial impact and mental health impact and impact for underserved communities. Before closing, I'd like to take a moment also to thank the whole team of the Center for Innovation and Social Work and Health, including our graduate and doctoral fellows and our person that helped us make this possible today, Mitra Sheriff. Um, so And I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the marketing and communications team who made also the online possible and the, being here and, and the photographer who is here. And um, to Diane Colley and BU Boats, who leads our school efforts to engage social workers and students in advocacy and voting. And we hope that the information from today's presentation can help all of us focus more in action and to advance, advance health equity. And if you're receiving continuing education credits, you are going to receive a link to a quiz, uh, email it completely completed. And we are planning exciting events the next year and the coming months. So be uh, look in the, our website for those events. And now I would like to invite everybody to join us in the lobby to continue the conversation and to meet these amazing leaders that are joining us now. And thank you for um, partners and, uh, and all the community that is here.